This is Mr. Spencer, and we're talking about Chapter 9 of The Great Gatsby. What a fancy, miserable, uplifting, inspiring, dark book as we lead into the last chapter. What's going to happen? Chapter 8 ended with Gatsby going for a swim in his pool and George Wilson murdering him, and then George Wilson shooting himself. So Myrtle's dead, George is dead, Gatsby's dead. Is anybody else going to die? Is this like a Shakespearean tragedy? All right, Chapter 9, Summary. The Great Gatsby ends in chapter 9 with one of the most famous last lines in all of Western literature, as Fitzgerald connects Gatsby's story with the universal hope for a better future. Just as The Great Gatsby began with Nick's father reminding him of his upbringing, so it ends with Gatsby's father reminding us about the childhood of James Gatz, which is Gatsby's real birth name, and as one of the few mourners at Gatsby's very sparsely attended funeral, Mr. Gatz worships his son's achievements in a way that no one whom Gatsby wanted to impress ever did. In detail, all right, chapter nine starts with the police investigation reducing what happened to the simplest possible terms, that Wilson was deranged by grief and killed Gatsby at random. I think in real life, Wilson probably thought Gatsby was the one Myrtle was having the affair with. But Myrtle's sister, remember Catherine, she doesn't tell the police about Myrtle having an affair. Rumors again swirl around Gatsby. And uninvited people again come to his mansion just to gawk at where the murder-suicide happened. Just like when they came to gawk at his parties. Nick is the only person who's still interested in Gatsby as a human being and becomes a kind of representative for him, both about the rumors and also about the logistics of dealing with his body and effects. Daisy and Tom have already left with no forwarding address by the time that Nick tries to call them about Gatsby's death. Nick tries to find Wolfsheim but can't get in touch with him. Wolfsheim sends a low effort letter but at least agrees to come to Gatsby's funeral. All right, so Nick answers the phone at Gatsby's house and expecting it to be Daisy calling, but instead it's someone associated with Gatsby's criminal enterprise. We get a quick idea that Gatsby was indeed doing something bigger than just bootlegging, something to do with stolen or counterfeit bonds. Okay, money, loans, stock market, counterfeit, fake, stolen. The man hangs up without another word as Nick tells him that Gatsby's dead. Three days later, Nick gets a telegram from Henry C. Gatz which is Gatsby's father. He read about Gatsby's death in a Chicago newspaper and is coming to the funeral from Minnesota. When Mr. Gatz shows up, it's clear that he is still pretty poor. He is in awe of what his son has been able to accomplish and clearly loves him very much. Gatz is clearly all in on the idea of the American dream. He's comparing Gatsby to a famous rags to riches railroad tycoon. When Gatz asks Nick to identify himself, Nick calls Gatsby his closest friend, is what he calls himself. That night, Ewing Klipspringer, the guy who crashed at Gatsby's for most of the summer, playing the organ, he calls. Nick assumes that he'll be coming to the funeral, but Klipspringer is only calling to get back a pair of shoes he left behind. Pathetic. The day of the funeral, Nick goes to see Meyer Wolfsheim in person. Wolfsheim's secretary lies and says that Wolfsheim is in Chicago. But when Nick mentions Gatsby's name, he's shown into Wolfsheim's office. Wolfsheim says that after Gatsby got out of the army, he met Wolfsheim at a pool hall and asked for a job. Wolfsheim saw the potential in Gatsby's good looks and his Oxford man aspirations. Gatsby used these qualities to make connections in places where Wolfsheim himself couldn't get in. Wolfsheim explains that he can't come to Gatsby's funeral after all. He doesn't want to be anywhere near a crime scene. Pathetic. Back at the mansion, Mr. Gatz shows Nick a picture of the Gatsby's mansion that Gatsby had sent back home. He also shows him a western, an old book that Gatsby loved to read. The back page has a schedule Gatsby had written for himself to follow, and a list of self-improvement initiatives he had undertaken. No one seems to be coming to the funeral, and it starts to rain, so Nick, Mr. Gatz, and the minister drive to the cemetery. The man with the owl-eyed glasses, the one who had been marveling at Gatsby's library of unread books in Chapter 3, he suddenly shows up to mourn with them. Nick doesn't know either his name or how he knew to be there, but many people look some religious symbolism into this owl-eyed man. But that's up to interpretation. 
Nick flashes back to a childhood memory of coming home from boarding school. He compares the Midwest that he and Gatsby and Tom and Daisy came from to the East Coast where they each made so many mistakes. So if Gatsby's really from Minnesota and Tom and Daisy spent time in Chicago, they're all from the Midwest. And Nick decides that he is fundamentally a Midwesterner himself and he needs to go back. Nick says he's from Minnesota. Nick goes to hash things out with Jordan. When she tells him that she's engaged, which seems unlikely since it's only been one week since they broke up from their little fling, Nick suddenly wants to get back together, but he thinks better of it. She does tell Nick that she felt very hurt when he broke up with her, but she seems completely over it. Is she? Jordan calls Nick out on his self-satisfaction with being scrupulously honest. Was he dishonest with her about his feelings? Several months later, Nick sees Tom in Manhattan and refuses to shake hands with him. Nick asks Tom what Tom told Wilson in the garage the night Myrtle was killed. Tom fesses up that he told Myrtle whose car ran over Myrtle, which enters the mystery of how Wilson was able to find Gatsby. The yellow car belonged to Gatsby. Tom said he told Mer Wilson that. Tom argues that telling Wilson the truth would have put Tom in danger since Wilson had a gun. Nick is horrified after all. It wasn't Gatsby who ran over Myrtle. It was Daisy. But he realizes that Tom is a spoiled child and tries to let his anger go. Gatsby's mansion goes to seed. People can buy it at auction. But before he leaves New York for good, Nick scrapes an obscene word off its stairs and then goes to the dock to think about the green light on Daisy's dock and Gatsby's hopes and his dreams. So we get to the end of the book. Gatsby stretching out for that green light. Only in Nick's memory now. Nick thinks about what this island looks like to the Dutch sailors who crossed the Atlantic a long time ago. He thinks about how we live in the perpetual hope of a better future with total disregard for the past. As the story ends on page 180, Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It had eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther, and one fine morning. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. <sighs> Take a deep breath. We're done.